Today we have a preview for you for Everstone Discovering Ignis. This is an action selection game from Sam McDavid and his new publishing company. We've got the game set up right here, but note that this has evolved quite a bit. This game board isn't it relevant anymore for the most part. It, graphically anyways, it's been changed quite a bit. Yeah, I think that he's kind of approaching this in a, in a way where he's going to keep developing this game up until the minute it's done. Well, certainly, so, certainly the looks of it anyway. Certainly the looks of it. So what you're seeing here on this board is going to look a little different if you're looking at the Kickstarter, but all of the information that's present here is the same. And this represents kind of the wilderness that we're going out to explore to gather things to bring back to here, which is Ignis. This is kind of the town. We're vying to be mayor or take control or lead. The leader However of you want to define that. And you're doing that by moving your little caravan out to these variable different action spaces. So that's kind of taking up the whole center of the board. But the real crux of the game is this reputation track over here. A lot of the actions you do move you up in that reputation, including completing some of these global achievements at the top and going up these different influence tracks, which will give you a bunch of different rewards in addition to victory points. But all of this is kind of contained in, a, in this space here. And that's gonna stay the same even with the new board. Yeah, and these little caravan tokens that you have, which are very cool, are represented for each player by their caravan boards. There are gonna be two boards, the reserve where you hold all of your resources, as well as your influ influence that you're going to put out, as well as your workshop. And the workshop mm -hmm. is where everything happens in this game. As you take a look at the workshop, you can see it's divided into four different columns or areas, if you will. You've got barter, explore, harvest, and repair. Those are the four actions you're going to take. You're gonna take one of those actions on each of your turns. Everyone starts at barter at the beginning of the game, and then every turn after that, you have to move to a new space and take that action. Now, sometimes it's as simple as just taking that action. But the cool thing about this game is you're going to be expanding this significantly because that whole column can have a lot of things going on. Not only is there the action, but potentially the first thing you could do is you could use an upgrade if you've done that in the game, and you'll be able to do that through a number of ways. And you can put an upgrade above the action. You could do that and you may do that if you want, then you can take the main action. Then there's gonna be a space below that. It holds a relic, but if it's not holding a relic, you're going to be able to use another action yeah. there that if you haven't covered it up. Then below that, there's gonna be spaces where you can tuck relics that you've repaired, which is a big part of the game, that are going to basically enhance that action. So effectively, you can stack up a bunch of tucked relics under that so that whenever you take that action, it is incredibly juicy, or maybe it makes up for taking one of the other actions a little less. Yeah, like David said, those relics are an incredibly important part of the game. A lot of what you're doing in gathering those resources is coming back to Ignis to buy these relics. And these relics, there's, a, there's one free, so you always have an option, but they are gonna uh, cost a progressively higher amount of resources to take these relics. Now, these are important and they're also uh, multi-use. So you're gonna be deciding a few things along the line, but the first thing you have to decide is which of your four actions you're going to place it on. When you're placing this relic on one of those four actions, not only are you blocking that little secondary action of that action, but you're also kind of deciding that when you do repair it, that is the column it's going to tuck under. Yeah. Now, there's some ways to affect that, but in general, once it's repaired, it's gonna tuck under that action and make that action better, or it's going to get discarded by never ever getting repaired for a little discard bonus, or it's getting <laughs> sold for a reward bonus that you can get for selling it. So you, you're making a lot of decisions with every single one of these cards. Yeah, it's really cool. All of them are gonna revolve around a cost on the left-hand side. That's only going to happen when it's on your board. You're never holding these relic yeah. cards in your hand. At the beginning of the game, everyone's gonna get three and there's alternate rules to draft those. And you're going to place one tucked under your board and anywhere you want. And then you're gonna place one on one of those four workshop spaces blocking that space then you're ready to go. You're gonna go out to the board through the explore action. It's going to be variable because the game comes with various villager tokens that you can put out here and explore. Not only that, when you explore one of these sections, say if I went here on my turn, I'm gonna take that action, but this token goes down here and kind of pushes up mm -hmm. another layer. So these tokens are gonna to kind of like move around, they're gonna change, you might see a token down here and think, oh, I wanna take that action. So then you're gonna to have to take the explore action or count, some, count on someone else taking the explore action so you can filter that up there because 
All of these aren't created equal. Some of them are fairly simple and straightforward. Others are pretty drastic, but can get you reputation points. Yeah, and you're gonna notice underneath each one of these actions, there is like a little icon here, like a little space that gives you some kind of bonus. This is where you're gonna be placing your influence tokens. This is another important part of the game. As you take actions, you'll be able to place these influence tokens down, and then if other players go to those actions, you get some kind of bonus. So this is some way of getting some kind of passive resources. If you think some of these actions are going to be more popular than others, you can kind of load up on them. But there's a lot of spaces you're gonna see where you're gonna be putting our influence tokens out on the board. And they don't all score you points. Like if you complete the achievements, they score you points. If you go up here to the top of these influence tracks, they score you points. But if you're just taking them off of your board, you're actually freeing up some areas in your reserve where you can store more resources because you're pretty limited on the resources you can have at the beginning of the game. And when you do the harvest action, which David will talk about, you're gonna get a ton of resources and so actually finding ways to get these tokens off of here and onto the board is very helpful for you. Yeah, I do want to talk about the harvest action because it is one of the more interesting and refreshing mechanisms that I've seen in a game. When you take the harvest action, you're going to roll some dice. Now, if you've looked at the Kickstarter page, you might see some dice and think, uh-oh. But this is not exactly that. It's not, it doesn't feel that limiting because you can mitigate these quite a bit. Yeah. But you're going to roll these dice up and then you're going to look at all three dice because it's going to relate to these three influence tracks. You see at the bottom of the influence tracks, this says two to five, six to eight, nine to 12. You're gonna use two of those dice to sort of fall within one of those ranges. And then the third dice is going to get you that quantity of the corresponding resource yeah. associated with that track. Not to mention, you will move up one space on that track. And all these spaces, or most of them, will have some bonuses that you can get. And if you time it right, those can be gotten at very opportunistic moments. Yeah. And at two players, three players, four players, you're going to be leapfrogging. So you want to get to the top and get some reputation. However, this game has an interesting mechanic in that as you go up and down those influence tracks, because there are plenty of cards that you can use to maybe go down those influence tracks to earn something, uh, you're going to get those bonuses whenever you move up and down. Now, you are getting only the bonus that you land on, but it's interesting that you can sort of utilize those tracks a little bit more than you would typical tracks. Yeah, and there's one other way that you're using the dice when you're rolling, and this is something, too, I haven't seen. Each one of these cards, these relic cards, actually has a different back. Whichever card is face up is going to have a collection of dice at the bottom. If you manage to roll that exact set of dice, or if you have ways of mitigating the dice, which the secondary ability of Harvest yes. does let you, you can mitigate them to match these dice. Then you get to look at this card and you just get it for free. So that's a, a way of getting relics without having to go through all of those multi-step processes. Yeah, that mitigation is really cool. You can spend yeah. gems to go up one, down one, maybe flip a die. Also on the back of those cards is going to be a different way to mitigate dice. Now you can use that one for free, but yep. just once. So it gives you a lot of opportunities to manip manipulate things, which is going to let you go, oh, I can't really get into red, or I can get into red, but I really want more red gems than yeah. three. I'm gonna up that so I can get more red gems. Right. It's a really interesting mechanic, and it really feels like a windfall, potentially, of gems that you're getting to pay for repairing the relics. Right, and repairing is like the main way that you're going to take those relics and like I said, either sell them for a one-time effect or tuck them under the board to make your actions better. Then of course we talked about the explorer action and then the barter action, which lets you return to Ignis is how you're primarily gonna get these cards and you're going to get some rewards. So you're gonna be able to buy relics and get rewards. Now the other cool thing here too is these rewards can be variable so you can have different setups for what you're getting when you return to the market. But a lot of the game is kind of extending out, getting stuff, either through exploring or harvesting, bringing it back to Ignis with the barter action, getting new relics, and then doing the repair action to actually repair those relics and either sell them or slot them. So that's kind of the cycle that you're gonna find yourself in turn after turn until somebody hits 10 points. And speaking of those reputation points, there's all sorts of ways to get them. You can spend a lot of your turns doing things that give you cards, move cards, go up the influence. Mm -hmm but you might not be getting a lot of reputation from all of those yeah. things. If you look around the board though, you can see like Ryan pointed out already, there's a lot of different places to get reputation. You just have to definitely look for them and seize them when you can, because when you do, you can make some pretty big turns. Yeah, you can. Some of the games we played, I've seen games where people can get four reputation yeah. in one turn. So if you've ever played things like Dune Imperium, very similar track, 
people can hold on to things. And one of those things you can hold on to are these personal quest cards. These are the only hidden information in the game. Yeah. And they're going to be very specific objectives that you're gonna look at and go, okay, I need to get X number of cards tucked underneath my explore action yeah. or under maybe all four actions or get so many upgrades. Very similar to a lot of the global achievements. Yeah, they're like the, they're almost like the global achievements, but just for you. Just for you. And there's a few different ways you can collect some of these. Mm -hmm. Everyone's gonna have two to begin with, but you could have these and go, okay, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Because when you lay them and achieve them, you flip them over and there's another space that's gonna give you another reputation. So you could really finish the game right away. Because once someone gets 10, it triggers the end of the game, and you just finish that round. There's no extra round or anything like that. Yeah, and there's a lot of sneaky ways to get reputation as well. Like, people are expecting you. They, they know if you're going to get to the top of a track, which keep in mind there's only four spots. Only four people will ever get those points. Right. You could claim multiples. There's only one person can claim each one of these achievements, so the first person to do it locks it out. But then there are card combinations. There are certain relics that when sold or repaired or tucked, can actually trigger and give you points for doing something specific as well. So you could have some relics that actually earn you points as you're playing the game too. So there's a lot of different ways to get to that 10 reputation. Yeah, I thought you were gonna talk about this one. This is yeah. probably the most tense way to get reputation because whenever you add influence to Ignis, and you're going to be adding influence at different locations depending on where your caravan is when you're spending that influence, when you add it here, you add it in this bottom row, then the second row, and then the top row, the top row giving a reputation. So in a multiplayer game, someone might put that yeah. second one out, and then everyone is looking to do something in Ignis where they can spend influence so they can get another reputation. Yeah, so if you like that action selection style game, if you like having that, that feeling of firing off a bunch of different combos, this game definitely has that in spades, it also has a, it's a very variable game. I mentioned the different rewards you can have here. We've talked about how these different uh, action location spaces can come out and there's more in the box and you're gonna use more or less depending on player count. So you're gonna have in incredibly variable situations. So it's gonna to lead to a different game every time you play it. Yeah, so that is Everstone. If you have any questions at all, please make them in the comments below or go to their camp page and check out all the information they have there. Until next time, make sure everyone has fun at the table and we'll see you then.